Is he in the same room? Oh. John. John Doney, we are starting service. Good morning and welcome to Alive Wesleyan Church. We just ask that you praise the Lord with our music. to see we want to see Jesus lifted high we want to see we want to see we want to see Jesus lifted high step by step we're moving forward little by little taking ground every prayer a powerful weapon strongholds come tumbling down see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by step we're moving forward, little by little taking ground. Every prayer a powerful weapon, strongholds come tumbling down and down and down. see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Amen. You may be seated. I want to welcome you to a live Wesleyan Church this morning. We're happy you're here with us to worship. Uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there, and uh, we want to invite you between services. Uh, Char has put together special treats for all the fathers, uh, a great time of fellowship, so we invite you to celebrate uh, between services during the fellowship time. Our call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 68. It says, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drives them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish in the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Amen? Amen. Well, a couple things. One is today is the last day to bring in the bottles for the baby bottle drive uh, for Father's Day. So hopefully you remember to bring those bottles in. Thanks for everybody who grabbed one of the baby bottles and filled them with change. So we appreciate that. If for some reason you forgot yours today, uh, you can try to drop it off throughout those week. But uh, we'll be delivering those to New Hope. Uh, also, with Father's Day today, there is no youth, and I know we're not having house church, uh, so check with your house church leaders, but I know a lot of the house churches aren't meeting today for Father's Day. Uh, family camp is coming up soon. If you look in your bulletin, there's an announcement about family camp down at Chambers. Uh, it's a great experience starting July 1st through July 10th. I know several people from the church are going to be down there, uh, so we encourage that. 
Wig is coming up this Tuesday, prayer meeting on Wednesday. Uh, we want to encourage you to keep praying about faith promise. I know there's no more slips in there, uh, but we want to ask you to pray about giving to missions in this church uh, as we continue to take faith promise slips. Also, today is day eight of those 21 days of empowerment, the devotional we've been going through, uh, and that's been a great devotional, a lot of encouragement through that. So we want to encourage you. It's not too late to be a part of those 21 days of devotional. Uh, you can still download, download it for free, uh, but that's been a great each day to, to kind of see the Spirit of God working. So we pray you to be a part of that. Also, it's not too late to sign up for prayer partners. Pastor Larry's put a, a sign-up sheet there, and in the back, uh, there's still lots of room. I think we're up to 30 prayer partners. So we want to encourage everybody to spend uh, 10 minutes on one day, five minutes praying for the pastors of the church, and five minutes praying for the ministry of the church. And if you have any questions, you can talk to Pastor Larry about that. Uh, all right. Uh, this morning, we have a special kids video. So at this time, we want to show that kids video. Stories of the Bible, the Apostles and the High Council. These are the Apostles. Hello. They followed Jesus during his time on earth. See ya. After he went to heaven, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be their helper. Then the Apostles spread the good news about Jesus everywhere they went. The apostles performed many miracles and healed the sick. They met regularly in the temple in Jerusalem, and many came to believe in Jesus. Huh. All this made the Jewish high priest and his officials very jealous, so they arrested the apostles and put them in jail. But an angel of the Lord came in the night Whoa! and opened the gate of the jail. The angel told them to go to the temple and tell people about Jesus. Got it. So at daybreak, the apostles went to the temple and told people about Jesus as the angel told them to. Meanwhile, the high priest and his officials called together a meeting of the high council. They sent the guards to bring the apostles out of jail, but when they went to the jail, they were gone. Wait, what? They returned to the council and reported that the men were gone. Guess what? Then someone arrived and announced that the men who were in jail were standing in the temple, teaching people. Go get them! The captain went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles. Come on, you. They brought them before the high council. The high priest said, We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name. Um, yeah, but... But Peter and the apostle said, We must obey God rather than any human authority. They told Jesus' story that he was raised from the dead after they hung him on the cross and that now he was in heaven. They told him that Jesus did all these things so that people of Israel would turn to God and be forgiven for their sins. This made the high council furious. And they decided to kill the apostles. But one Pharisee named Gamaliel stood up and ordered that the men be sent outside the council for a while. Then he warned his fellow Jewish leaders that killing the apostles might bring more trouble than good. He advised them to leave the apostles alone. Not a good point. The other Pharisees saw his point and accepted his advice. They called the apostles in and had them beat up, but they didn't kill them. They ordered them to never speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. The apostles left the high council happy that God thought them worthy to suffer for preaching the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. I encourage you to remember that video as we're going to look at it in the sermon today, part of it. Let's start off with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, we do thank you that you're a great and awesome God. We thank you for your grace and your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for 
calling us in your presence this morning and just the ability to worship together. Father, we pray that you'd be in the midst of this service, that you would bless it. And even now, Lord, that you'd begin to prepare our hearts. Father, that you'd make our hearts tender to whatever it is you want to say to them. And may you speak to us, whether it's through a time of silence, whether it's through the words of some song we may sing, or as we open up your word in a few moments. Now, Lord, we just give this time to you and pray that you will sanctify it, make it holy for your purposes, Father. Bless this service. We pray all this in your mighty name. Amen. This time, we'll release the kids. They want to head down to Sunday school. And this morning, uh, we actually have a, a couple of great celebrations we get to do as a church together. And the first one is we get to dedicate Simon Michael. So if Scott and Sarah want to come forward. Last week we got to do baptism. Uh, this morning we get to do another great act together uh, of dedicating an infant. This is fun. Yeah, you hold the baby at the beginning, I hold the baby later. It's a greater chance of him staying happy that way. Uh, but it's a great and awesome privilege to be able to dedicate someone to the, the Lord. And uh, as you'll hear as we go through it, it's really a, a dedication of the parents, of Scott and Sarah, and, and their willingness to say that we will be godly parents, that we will raise our child in the fear and the love of the Lord. And it's also a call to us as a congregation that we will stand beside them and support them with our prayers and encouragement, uh, that raising a child is not uh, just their responsibility, but that we as their church family will be there for them. So, Dear Scott and Sarah, you have brought this child whom God has given you to be dedicated to God and to his service. By this act, you testified your faith in the Christian religion and also your desire that your child should receive the benefits of consecration to God and the prayers of the church, that may early he may learn to follow and know the will of God and therefore may live a Christian life. In order for this to happen, it will be your duty as parents to teach your child early the fear of the Lord, to watch over his education that he may not be led astray by false teachings or doctrines, to direct his mind to the Holy Scriptures expressing the will and authority of God for all people, and to direct his feet to the sanctuary, to restrain him from evil associates and habits as much as you are able, and to bring him up in the Lord's discipline and instruction. Will you endeavor to do so by the help of the Lord? If so, say, we will. Amen. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter into it. He took the child in his arms and put his hands on them, and he blessed them. All right, you ready for the fun part? Get you, you're all dressed up. Oh, what do you think? Oh. See everybody out there? Hey. Well, Scott and Sarah present their child, Simon Michael, to be dedicated to the Lord. So let's bow in prayer and dedicate him. Little Simon Michael, we thank you, Lord, that you are a gift from God. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of God in you for the life that he has given you. We thank you, Lord, for your parents. And Father, we pray today that he will just bless you and sanctify you. We dedicate you to him, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will just be with Simon Michael, that you will watch over him and bless him, Lord, and have your hand upon him, that he may early know your grace and your love, Lord. Watch over him and direct his footsteps. And Lord, we pray that you would be with Scott and Sarah, give them all the patience and love and wisdom that they need, Father. Lord, we thank you for your great and awesome love and this gift of this child, Father. We pray this in your awesome name. Amen. Amen. You ready? No crying at all. Yeah, he wants to stay with you today. You want to stay with me? You want to preach? I want to say one more thing. and just be able to go back. This is a dedication from the book of Numbers uh, that is always used in Romania. And I want to say the same prayer over them and the dedication of him. Numbers chapter 6, 22 through 27. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and saying, In this way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And he says, so they shall put my name on the children of Israel and bless them. Amen. Amen. Especially when you dedicate a child that never cries during church. It's a lot easier to bless them. Well, this morning we have another special thing to celebrate. Uh, as many of you know, for the last uh, several months, we've had a special men's study. Uh, Gordy's been leading a study. Uh, it's a resolution of men. I'm going to invite Gordy up here. Uh, that class uh, recently came to an end, and it went through, and uh, he wants to explain and, and kind of celebrate that a little bit this morning. So, Gordy? Uh, it was a fantastic study. Uh, I encourage anyone who is interested to take part in it. It was very well done. But I want to give a quick ex excerpt of the movie because it is very powerful. A father should love his children and seek to win their hearts. He should protect them, discipline them, and teach them about God. He should model how to walk with integrity and treat others with respect and call out his children to become responsible men and women who love their lives for what matters in eternity. Some men will hear this and mock it or ignore it, but I tell you that as a father, you are accountable to God for the position of influence he has given you. You can't fall asleep at the wheel, only to wake up one day and realize your job or your hobbies have no eternal value, but the souls of your children do. Some men will hear this and agree with it, but have no resolve to live it out. Instead, they will live for themselves and waste the opportunity to leave a godly legacy for the next generation. But there are some men who, regardless of the mistakes we've made in the past, regardless of what our fathers did not do for us, will give the strength of our arms and the rest of our days to loving God with all that we are and to teach our children to do the same. And whenever possible, to love and mentor others who have no father in their lives but who desperately need help and direction. In my home, the decision has already been made. I don't have to ask who will guide my family because by God's grace, I will. You don't have to ask who will teach my son and daughter to follow Christ, because I will. Who will accept the responsibility of providing for and protecting my family? I will. Who will ask God to break the chain of destructive patterns in my family's history? I will. Who will pray for and bless my children to boldly pursue whatever God calls them to do? I am their father. I will. I accept this responsibility and it is my privilege to embrace it. On this Father's Day, I have the special privilege of recognizing a group of men that have and will continue to commit to a resolution based off the movie Courageous, but more importantly, derived upon the highest priorities for men in God's word. So at this time, I ask the men who completed this course or took part in it to please come up. the commitment that we've all sworn to take one by one, and the men will answer, I will, if they commit to each resolution spoken. Will you solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for yourself, your wife, and your children? I will. Will you love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the word of God as the spiritual leader of your home? I will. Will you be faithful to your wife to love and honor her and be willing to lay down your life for her as Jesus Christ did for you? I will. Will you bless your children and teach them to love God with all their hearts, all their minds, and all their strength? I will. Will you train them to honor authority and live responsibly? I will. Will you confront evil, pursue justice, and love mercy? I will. Will you pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion? I will. 
Will you work diligently to provide for the needs of your family? I will. I will. Will you forgive those who have wronged you and reconcile with those that you have wronged? I will. Will you learn from your mistakes, repent from your sins, and walk with integrity as a man answerable to God? I will. Will you seek to honor God, be faithful to his church, obey his word, and do his will? I will. Will you courageously work with the strength God provides to fulfill this resolution for the rest of your life and for his glory? I will. Thank you. I will conclude by praying for these men of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these men up here today that have taken these commitments, that you give them wisdom as they continue to grow in your word and in understanding of the great privilege and responsibility that it is being a man of God. I pray that you help these men protect their families, serve their families, teach their families the word of God, and be the spiritual leaders of their homes. Lord, we praise you for this awesome responsibility, and to you be all the glory. Amen. <laughs> and I think as we celebrate Father's Day, uh, I just appreciate Gordy teaching his class and these guys. I think we should give them a round of applause. Those are two great ways to celebrate fathers today, uh, dedicating a child and also as a great study. I appreciate Gordy leading that and for the men that went through it, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, we are going to have a, a short time of prayer together, but we have one more last thing to do. Uh, Gary, who is our privilege to be our delegate to district conference, uh, is going to get up, right? Uh, Gary was just going to give a short testimony about district conference that was down uh, at Victory Highway for Thursday and Friday. It was a privilege to be selected to go as a delegate, along with Bev Robinson, to the uh, second merger of the conference. One thing that I've I noticed at this conference was at many conferences. There's always a emphasis on the financial side of business. This one was completely different. Every testimony and all the discussions from the district superintendent all the way down was geared towards the Word of God. How they can help the churches to reach out and uh, that was the thing that struck me the most was what can we do to help you but everything and everything was for one purpose to glorify God in everything that we do and uh, that was the lasting impression that I got out of this and it was very enlightening eye-opening and it's uh, I haven't experienced that before in any kind of conference I've been to in the past. So I want to thank you for that and uh, look forward to next year's. Thank you. Well, we won't do, uh, I want to do, want to lift up some prayer requests uh, to let you know. Uh, Sharon had her surgery on Friday. Uh, she's recovering from that, but I ask you to continue to lift up her in prayer as they do further tests and see the results of that surgery. We want to lift her up. And also Phil. Uh, Phil was taken to the hospital uh, yesterday. Uh, he has a really low blood, red blood count. And they were doing a transfusion. And hopefully he's going back to Rochester this morning. Uh, but I haven't heard how the results of that transfusion went. So uh, let's bow in prayer, especially lifting up Sharon and Phil uh, this morning. Dear Holy Father and gracious Lord, we do thank you that you are a great healer and an awesome God. Father, we thank you that we can come before you in a time of prayer, and Lord, that you are willing and able to meet us where we're at. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can lift one another up, and Lord, that you are a God who knows what we need even before we ask of it. Father, we thank you for this Father's Day, 
And Lord, regardless of who our earthly fathers were, we thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate you this morning, that you have been a good, good father to us. Father, I thank you for Gordy and his class and for the, the guys that were up here this morning and their commitment to you. Father, I pray for your blessing over them as they testify in front of the whole congregation their willingness to be godly fathers and husbands and, and, and part of this community. So I pray for your blessing over them. Father, we continue to pray for your blessing of Scott and Sarah and Simon and their whole family, Lord. And Father, this morning we lift up Sharon to you. We pray for her, Lord, as she's gone through these treatments and surgery, Lord. Father, we pray that your hand will be upon her, Lord, that she will just get great results from further testing, Lord. We pray for your total and complete healing over Sharon. Father, that we will be able to celebrate and testify in the midst of the congregation that when this is all said and done, that Sharon will be canceled and touched by you, Lord. Father, I imagine this morning as we come into your presence that there are others here that have prayer requests and burdens on their life, Lord. We lift one another up. Father, we know that you are a God who hears us and a God that is at work and that you're able to do immeasurably more than we can even ask or think. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the power that is found in prayer. And we lift each of these up to you this morning. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. This time I ask the praise team to come back up and lead us in worship. Can you feel it? God is in our house. Amen. Let's stand and praise his name.
Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. And I want to say as we begin the sermon, this morning we're going to talk about something that's, you know, difficult to talk about, something that will be personal for many people. And I want you to know that I don't 
preach this message lightly. You know, in fact, I came over this morning at about 6.45 and just spent an hour in prayer before the message to think about how to say and what I want to say uh, as we go through this. And you'll see it as we read this passage. But I think it's important to have a conversation. I think it's sad in our country right now where we seem unable to have conversations about tough things. So this morning, as we look at this, you know, I want us to see what God's Word says. I, I want that to speak, not my own opinion or my own thoughts about it, or honestly, your opinions or thoughts about it, but what does God say about it? What is it that God is saying to us? And, and I want us to look at this, and as I say about the importance of having conversations, I'd be more than happy to sit down and talk with anyone uh, about this or after the message. But I want us to look at this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 through 11, and to see what God has to say to us this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 through 11. It begins by saying, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matter? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren. For brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to the law against one another. What, what, why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourself be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. May God bless that passage as we look at it. And as always, I encourage you to keep your Bible open. Well, we're down to the last two messages I get to preach and share with you at a live Wesleyan church. And Next week, I know many of you said, you know, we're going to be away, school's out, and people are going away on vacation, so this might be it for me to, to preach to you and to share any wisdom I might have. Today is also Father's Day, and as I stand up here before you as the pastor that I am, as I have been for the past 18 years, I'm reminded of an old saying that whenever you see a, a turtle up on a fence post, you know one thing for sure, it did not get up there by itself. And today I want you to know that I am that turtle, right? I may be the one up here, but many people have come alongside of me to raise me up farther than I could have ever been on my own. The great baseball Hall of Famer, Harmon Calibrew, who played most of his career for the Minnesota Twins, once wrote, my father used to play with me and my brother in the yard, and my mother would come out and say, you're tearing up the grass. And my dad would reply, we're not raising grass, we're raising boys. And I think of that quote for myself being Father's Day. One of the greatest influences in my life that has raised me up and, and put me on this fence post is my dad, right? He never raised me to be a ball player. And truth be told, I wouldn't even say he overtly raised me to be a pastor. He never pushed me into ministry. He never tried that. But he raised me to walk in faith, to love the Lord, and model what it meant to be a godly man. And here as we get to the end, I always like to, to pull this Bible out. Some of you will recognize it, but uh, this is the Bible that he gave me when I was a teenager. And uh, as I've said many times, it's seen a lot better days. It's held together mostly with glue and tape now. And if you were to look at it, there's a lot of torn pages, a lot of dog-eared pages. Uh, but he gave this to me when I was a, a teenager and it is the Bible that I, I preached out of when I first came to a live Wesleyan church. It's the Bible that I've taken on dozens of trips to Romania and, and different places in the world on missions trips and preached out of. And, and even as I hold it up here today, it, it'll forever hold a special place in my heart on Father's Day. One, because my dad gave it to me. And through the many years, it has been 
slowly ripped apart, I guess from good use. He told me that even before he get, got it to me, our, our dog got a hold of it and, and threw it all apart, so it didn't really have a great start in life. But I always saw it as something very sacred and special, right? Your dad gives you this Bible, and, and I always tried to take the utmost care to keep it together. So I would buy like, like fake leather, and I would try to glue it back together, and, and, and Mata can tell you how I spent years trying to keep the thing together, but it was always falling apart. Well, then on a, a missions trip to Romania, when we were visiting Romania, Magda's dad, Pastor Rudy Costia, who was so influential in me becoming a pastor, right? If, if my own dad never pushed me into ministry, Magda's dad never hesitated to not so gently nudge me into ministry. But one day he saw how beat up my Bible was, and I think maybe the cover had fallen off, and so he took it from me and said, well, I'll fix that for you. Now, for years, I had diligently tried to preserve the perfectness of it. So he took it, and he promptly wrapped it in packing tape, uh, which is still on it today. And so when I look at this Bible, and I see the Bible and the packing tape, I see both the, my dad and my father-in-law, who so influenced me. Two godly servants that impact me, a huge part of why I stand up here today as a pastor. And, and both of them instilled in me the importance of God's work. There was a story that I wanted to share this morning that my dad shared in a church service years and years ago. He, he probably told this in church 35 years ago, but it's always stuck with me. And, and to this day, it, it always comes back to my mind. I can always remember it. And I, I remember him telling this in church, and I was telling this on Tuesday evening at a board meeting. But he said once in church, all those years ago, he talked about a farmer who had a horse and that farmer fed his horse oats, as you do. But as time went by, he said the oats were getting more and more expensive, and he, he thought to himself, well, you know what? What would happen if I mixed some sawdust in with those oats? You know, I could feel the, feed the horse mostly oats, but I'll, I'll mix in some sawdust, and that will make it go farther. The horse will still get the nutrients from the, the oats, but it'll feel full from the sawdust. So the farmer decided to try it, so he takes... 75% oats, and he mixes in 25% sawdust. And he feeds it to the horse. And he waits to see what happens. And guess what happens? The horse is fine. Horse eats it up. Horse seems healthy. The farmer's saving money. He thought to himself, what a great deal. I'm saving money. The horse is feeding great. It's all wonderful. And so he kept going like that. But then a, a little while later, you know what? He said, well, what if I tried 50% oats and 50% sawdust? I, I bet the horse would still be fine, right? And I would save even more money. So he started feeding the horse 50% oats and 50% sawdust, and he gives it to the horse, and the horse eats it up, and great. The horse still was doing fine. After a little while longer, he thought to himself, well, this is going so great. How about if I give the horse 25% oats and 75% sawdust? And he switched to that. Well, I'll be, the horse was still doing fine. And he couldn't believe it. He was saving so much money that one day he said, you know what? I'm going to just give the horse 100% sawdust and no oats. So he gives the horse 100% sawdust, and guess what happens? The horse dies. <laughs> and I've always remembered that story because he connected it with the Bible. We think that we can get along with just a, a little bit less of the Bible. And, and then maybe, maybe just a little bit less than that. And we add lots of filler, and then somewhere along the line we're like, well, I'll take on ed editing privileges. We dilute here, and we, we avoid this passage there, and we say, well, this part doesn't apply anymore, and this part isn't politically correct anymore, and so we'll avoid that. And, and I always think about this story that if the farmer on day one had given the horse 100% sawdust, my guess is the horse would not have eaten it, right? It would have recognized it for what it was. But the fact that he gave him a little bit, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. And I think that's the danger that the church can be in as well. Right? We can get slowly lulled into feeding on garbage and fluff, and not recognize are we dying spiritually? Deuteronomy 8.3, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And I want you to notice that Moses writes every word. 
not just the comfortable ones. Right? There are going to be passages in the Bible that are difficult. There's passages in the Bible that we are going to have to wrestle with. Passages like this 1 Corinthians 6 one. You know, for the past 18 years, whenever I've preached, I've always wanted to bring you the Word of God, the undiluted Word of God. That has been my primary objective of the sermons. I'm fairly confident you didn't hire me for my great singing voice. You didn't hire me because of my drama skills or even this pretty face. It was Paul's exhortation to a young pastor named Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. And I thought about, as I, as I come to the close of this, this time here, I want to be like Paul to say, Acts twenty twenty seven, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Like I said, even if that includes tough passages, even if that includes difficult passages, even if that includes parts that we're not comfortable with or we, we have to wrestle with, I want you to think back to the, the kids' video that we showed earlier in the service. Right? This is the, the early church and the early followers of Jesus. And it comes from Acts chapter 5, 17 through 42. And, and it, the story begins with an angel coming to the disciples, and he tells them, here's what your message should be. And it was fairly simple, wasn't it? Tell people about Jesus. And, and then you have this back and forth. Right, you have this back and forth between the church and, and the religious leaders of the world. Right, The church is, is, is told by God, go and tell people about Jesus. And society said, don't tell them about Jesus. And, and the religious leaders at that time begin to persecute the church. And they, they begin to threaten the disciples. The council says in Acts 5.28, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name, the name of Jesus? And then Peter says those bold, powerful words. We ought to obey God rather than men. And we're told that the council was furious, right? The, the guy in the video, his face gets all bright red. They beat them up, right? We are going to tell the story, and the world says we forbid it and order them never to tell the story. Well, what is the story of Jesus? Well, I would submit to you it is a story about being saved by grace. Right? We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all sinned. And he has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. Right? That is the story of Jesus. The story that the church was commanded to tell. The gospel is this. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, but Jesus died for us and he offers us the gift of grace. All right? I'm guessing that none of that made you uncomfortable. So why come here to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, right? Is it to make some people uncomfortable? Is it to cause a conflict? No, that's not what it's for. But in a way, this passage is a litmus test for sawdust and oats. Because it's not a popular text to preach from for obvious reasons. But I want us to go through it together to look at what it really says. Because it begins kind of strangely. Right? Some of you, as I get this big warning before the message, you're going through and you're like, well, this isn't controversial. Right? Because it kind of starts off strangely because the first admonishment is what? Don't sue each other in the church. In fact, the whole first part of the passage is about not suing each other about how we judge one another. And I ask you, how often do we worry about that anymore? Right? Is that a hot-button topic in the church, about suing each other in the church? We don't even think about it, right? But the Apostle Paul begins this section by pointing out that there should be a contrast between the church and the world, right? That there's meant to be a difference. He says this, but brother, this is verse 6, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers, right? There's this contrast between the world and the church. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brother. Well, Paul says in this case, he says it's an utter failure. Think about that. Paul talks to the church and he says it's an utter failure 
if you act like the world around you. But then he gets into the meat of the message, and and this is what I want us to see. John Stott wrote, we should stop asking what is wrong with the world, for that diagnosis has already been given. Rather, we should ask what has happened to salt and light. Well, here's Paul's message to the church, and I I don't want to lose you in this. I want you to listen very carefully like the Bereans in Acts 17.11, where it says, they received the word with all readiness, and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So I want you to look in your Bibles, and I want you to listen to verses 9 and 10, not with any kind of preconceived notions, not with, well, I'm building this argument in my mind, whether it either proves it or disproves it, but just listen to God's word when it says this in 9 and 10. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Well, why is this passage important? Is it important because, ha-ha, see, homosexuality is a sin? Well, no, not really. It is listed as one of the many sins here. It is not highlighted above the other sins. It is not seen as some supreme sin. In fact, look at the two verses, right? If you want to make a list, and I know sometimes we want to pull out certain sins and say, well, I'm going to elevate this one, right? Homosexuality and sodomites. But look at the whole list because it tells us something far more important. How many of these sins are sins the world cares about? How many of these does the world condemn versus how many of these does the world not only condone but celebrate? Fornication. That seems to be celebrated in our culture, doesn't it? Does anyone care? Drunkenness. Well, there's no real shame in there. Parting, coveting, homosexuality. These are not actions or attitudes that our current culture blinks an eye at. So why does Paul list these? Well, the answer is by what Paul doesn't list. You might say, huh? Well, what's missing from the list? Well, Paul, what about murderers? Are they going to inherit the kingdom of God? What about people who abuse children, Paul? Are they going to get into heaven? Well, Paul doesn't list them because even the world acknowledges them as sin, right? The world acknowledges them as bad. He's speaking to a church trying to live a holy life in the midst of an ever-changing morality of a culture around it. Right? How do we as the church navigate what is right and what is wrong, what is moral and what is not wrong and moral, in in a culture that is constantly changing the standards of what morality is. And and so he lists things that the culture they were in did not necessarily see as wrong, but the Word of God did. What do we do when culture changes around us what is moral and it conflicts with God's Word, right? When we call evil good and good evil. Well, I would submit to you that society is not the best judge and definitely not the supreme authority of what is right and wrong. Right, 170 years ago, they said slavery. Well, that's okay. 70, 60 years ago, society told us segregation was all right. So Paul speaks to these Christians in Corinth, a city that was known for immorality, and he reminds them, do not be deceived by sin. The culture of the day does not define what is right and wrong. God's word has not changed to meet whatever wind of culture there is. And I would say that these verses by the Apostle Paul are vitally important to understand and process in our Christian faith. And that's why I want us to look at them, not kind of get lost in defending a position and say, well, I always knew that, or or, I don't agree. Again, what is Paul saying in these verses? One, he's clearly stating there is sin. And that there is sin has consequences, right? Real, lasting consequences. Verse 9, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Right? We have churches and we have well-meaning, loving people that have been deceived. Right? In an effort to to love people, they've diluted God's word. Instead of offering them true love and hope, they said, well, that's all right. What do we do with the Bible then? Right? That's the ultimate question. Right? Whatever the world wants to do, the world is going to do because it's not held to the same standard. But his question is, what are you going to do if you believe the Bible to be true? What are you going to do with these verses? And and friends, again, I encourage you not to be like, well, yep, that one's a sin. 
but this one, that's okay. Right? Read the whole list. Right? They aren't listed in some kind of hierarchy. He's saying these are all sins and they all have consequences. But beyond that, a church that doesn't acknowledge sin and its severity and consequences really has no Savior to offer. As churches have reduced sin, they at the same time have destroyed the gospel message and the importance of Jesus. Instead of the gospel which gives life, they've been feeding people sawdust for years. Look out and they say, oh, the church is full. Everybody's smiling, everybody's happy, everybody's worshiping. It looks great, but what is the end? I'm always reminded that one of the greatest worship worship celebrations in all the Old Testament, it says there were tons of people there, and they're worshiping, and they're singing, and they're praising, and they're dancing all over. And it says their worship reached the mountains, and their worship filled the valleys. And, And as the Israelites danced and worshiped around a golden calf, they had made themselves. And as they worshipped all the while, it says in Exodus 32, God was ready to consume them in his anger. A church should always ask itself, what are we worshipping? Who are we worshipping? Why are we worshipping? So see, there's sin, and that's the first part. We won't get into heaven living in unrepented sin, but that's not the whole message here, and that's why I want you to stay with me, right? Before we as a church right, begin to puff ourselves up and we begin to feel a little bit self-righteous, what do we see? The beginning of verse 11 says what? And such were some of you. Right? Before we're like, well, 9 and 10, those are the terrible sinners, and, and they deserve to be in hell. He says, don't remember that, and such were some of you. Sinners saved by grace. Carlisle Marty once wrote, many Christians define sin as the sum total of actions which they themselves do not commit. But see, here's what I see as the power of this section, which is a shame if we don't wrestle with it, right? If it, if it gets just a little bit too edgy or we don't, we don't feel comfortable reading this section of the Bible, see, this reason the passage is such a boiling point of controversy is because it breaks down all the barriers of self-righteousness on both sides, right? And there is self-righteousness on both sides. Those who want to say, well, there is no sin and you can't judge me, no, Paul says, do not be deceived. But then it breaks down Christian self-righteousness who wants to judge sinners with the truth that we've all sinned. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Do you see that? This passage does illuminate sin to us, but it also reminds us of God's amazing grace. That the, the people and the sins mentioned in verses 9 and 10 are not excluded from the kingdom of God apart from God's grace. It's steeped in humility on both sides. And yes, there's sin. But then you come to verse 11, and what do we find? The recognition of hope. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you. But then what does he write? But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What have we said several times lately? We've said that every good gospel message, every time the gospel is presented, it should hold up the truth of sin, but it should never leave us hopeless and in despair. And Paul exemplifies that same beautiful truth here. The church fails when it takes these verses and says, well, this is a hammer I'm going to hit you in the head with. He's not trying to divide us up. He's not looking down his finger and saying, you sinner there, boo, boo. You're terrible, I condemn you. He's saying there's a different standard between the world and God. And church person, it is not that you are perfect and somehow immune. No, and some and such were some of you. Don't forget that. Don't forget where you once were before God found you. But then comes the beauty and the good, no, good news of hope in three glorious phrases, right? You could underline them in your Bible. But you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified. In being washed, Jesus is saying your sins, which are many, can be forgiven. I don't care if you look at that list and there's ten sins there. I don't care if you say, well, I've done all ten or if you've only done one. He says whatever amount of sins you've done, they can be forgiven. 
The blood of Christ shed for us on Calvary cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But you were washed, right? That's step one. Then he says, but you were sanctified. God not only forgives you, but he wants to do an amazing work in your life to give you victory over sin. It's not really any good if God just says, well, I forgive you of your sins, but then you are forever stuck in those sins. So he says, I'll sanctify you. That's the hope. That's real hope. Not just saying, well, be happy in your sins. It's real hope, not the facade of religion. Pastor and author Derek Prince wrote, if you take a peach out of the refrigerator for a few days, it begins to spoil. If you put it back in the refrigerator, it does not stop decaying. It only slows down the process. Religion is a refrigerator. It slows down corruption, but it does not stop it. See, we don't want to settle for religion, right? I've never stood up here and said, you know what? I want you to be religious. We need to push unto sanctification, right? The Bible says that is God's will for you, the sanctification of your souls. Jesus Christ at work in you to transform us, right? We can have victory. We don't have to be a slave to any sin. That is the power of the gospel. But then here comes the best part. He writes these three phrases. But you are washed, you are sanctified. And then he writes these four words. But you were justified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Well, what does that mean? To be justified means God stands over you and he pronounces you are not guilty. Right? Isn't that what we need to hear? Right? Whatever sins might be in your life, no matter how you might have failed, failed, think of God putting his hand over you and saying, you know what? You are not guilty. John MacArthur wrote it this way. Washed speaks of new life, of regeneration. Sanctified speaks of new behavior and holiness. And justified speaks, speaks to a new standing before God. William Barclay wrote, the proof of Christianity lay in its power, not just to condemn sin, but the power to change and free us. You know, this entire passage reminds us of the, the consequences of living according to the world, but it ends by reminding us of why we sing the song Amazing Grace. And I pray that even as we may wrestle with it, even as the passage may not be comfortable, but as you read it, the take-home message is this. Don't be deceived by sin. Stop settling for eating sawdust and thinking it's the word of God that brings life. But he says, remember grace. Show grace. Share the message of hope. Be that light in the darkness. And he says, celebrate with hope both the work that Christ has done in your life and the work he can do in others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord that you are a God of grace and hope. Father, we thank you that you're a God who washes us, sanctifies us, and justifies us. And Father, sometimes your word is, is hard to look at. Sometimes there are places in your word that it convicts us and challenges us. Sometimes there's places in your word that are just hard for us to take in. And Father, maybe there's some here that read this passage and immediately a, a wall goes up. Maybe there's others here that begin to feel self-righteous. Lord, help us to see your word and more importantly, help us to hear your voice speaking to us. Father, most importantly, help us to see this passage is not for us to throw upon others, but a passage is speaking to our own hearts. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you give us not only the power to forgive us, but the power to change us, to make us into sons and daughters of God, and that you're a God who pronounces over us, you are not guilty. Father, thank you for challenging us where we get too comfortable. Father, I pray that we'll take this word from you, and we pray it all in your wonderful name. Amen. I ask you to stand as we close and worship together.
benediction from Psalm 121. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out and coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Go in his name. Amen.